Human Sacrifice by John Amirich Edward Dahlberg Part 1 In the recent volumes of his miscellanies, Lord Stanhope had published a correspondence between himself, Sir Robert Peel, and Lord Macaulay on human sacrifice among the Romans. The letters had for some time been privately circulated and had attracted much attention to this singular phenomenon in the history of humanity. But the most remarkable fact about them is that two of the writers regard human sacrifice as so conclusive a sign of a barbarous society that, in defiance of the strongest and most abundant evidence, they endeavor to prove that it had no existence among the civilized Romans. That Sir Robert Peel and Lord Macaulay were in error in this strange opinion will hardly be questioned by any student of antiquity, and our object, therefore, in this paper is not so much to refute their arguments as to trace in different ages, different countries, and different systems the religious idea and the varying forms of the rite, which was the subject of their discussion. Human sacrifice is an institution which may be the outward sign of contrary religious ideas and of opposite extremes of civilization and barbarism. But instead of distinguishing its local causes and circumstances, the different writers on the subject have tried to generalize all the instances of it into a single law, advocating each his one view of the meaning of the rite, and consequently giving contradictory explanations. But in reality, different nations have approached it by different paths, and it is therefore a symptom sometimes of one, sometimes of another phase of cultivation, reacting in different ways on the national character. By human sacrifice, we do not understand every act of putting a man to death with religious forms, or in obedience to a religious idea. When a nation of fanatics wages a war of extermination against those who do not worship its gods and piles up pyramids of bodies, the idea of honoring the divinity does but dimly tinge the savage thirst for blood. When a traveler, cast on an inhospitable shore, like that of Tarise, is murdered by the inhabitants to appease the god whose lands his foot has defiled, it is the act of barbarians, who imagine that their gods, like themselves, look on every stranger as a foe. Sacrifici genus est, sic institere priores, et vina virginio, se sus, ut en se cadet. Or, when an unwary wanderer trespasses on the consecrated grove, or witnesses the secrets of an unnatural worship, his murder, even at the altar, is rather the punishment of sacrilege than a real sacrifice. In the German armies, the priests alone could inflict punishment. Quote, ne verbere quidem nisi sacerdotibus permissim non quasi imponem nec ducas jusu, sed vela deo imperante. Unquote. In Iceland, the judgment seat was close to the altar where the condemned were slain. Here, the gods were avenged by the punishment of the criminal, and civil justice received a religious sanction. When the wife or slave was burnt or buried with the chief, it was to console the departed spirit, and when slaves or prisoners were slaughtered at his tomb, it was an homage to him, not to honor the gods. So in our day, wretches are wantonly put to death on the slave coast to celebrate some great occasion. The arrival of a distinguished traveler must be notified to the departed spirits, but the victim who carries the news is not properly sacrificed. In Russia, there are great pits black with smoke and the charred bones of men, but the sect whose votaries have perished there never dreams of offering men in sacrifice to God, but believes that death is better than life, and suicide an atonement for guilt, and the crown of a well-spent life. Again, cannibals who believe that their gods delight in human flesh or savages who slay all their prisoners, will set apart a portion of their victims for the share of the gods, or those who, instead of killing, reserve the prisoner as a chattel of no more value than so many sheep or oxen, will sacrifice men, not as things different in kind from cattle, but as representing a certain amount of property. The pious owner will immolate so many sheep, or so many bullocks, or so many slaves, according to the solemnity of the occasion, or the convenience of his establishment, not through the idea that the slave, as being like his master, is different from the beasts offered with him. No distinct religious significance is attributed to the nature of the victim. The cannibal offers human flesh to his cannibal god, and in this, the celebrated author, Wolf, imagined that he had discovered the origin of all human sacrifices. The savage slave owner sacrifices the slave with other animals, without a thought of his humanity, without a scruple about killing, torturing, or defiling him, because he is taught that the slave has no moral existence, and can have no moral value in the sight of the gods 
when he has no rights among men. Such acts, though like sacrifice in externals, must rather be classed under the heads of religious intolerance, wholesale massacre, military execution, criminal law sanctioned by religion, the penalty of sacrilege, the funeral rites of a people whose Hades is only a continuation of this life, and the effects of cannibalism and slavery. They are all compatible with the disavow or even the abhorrence of human sacrifice. And yet, as acts of immolation tinged with superstition, they indicate habits on which the institution could be grafted and with which it could easily coalesce. Yet there is an essential distinction to be made between the cases in which a religious idea has been superadded to a barbarous custom, giving it an outward hypocritical varnish, and those in which the inhuman right can be directly traced to a theological idea. Without this distinction, the subject will remain obscure, and its discussion will only lead into profitless generalities. In the one case, the sufferer is a victim of the ignorance and ferocity of savages, who, in degrading their gods to their own level, and looking on their captives as no better than beasts, betray the most material conception of divinity. The practice grows up in some of the deepest stages of degeneracy, and tends still further to debase man and corrupt the idea of God. It is not consistent with a thoughtful theology or an advanced culture, and therefore disappears with the progress of civilization, and is unable to coexist or combine with the rights which, though perhaps equally sanguinary, proceed from the most subtle and logical developments of pagan belief. Thus, the same act, which in the one case displays the ferocity of the savage, his vindictiveness, and his godless ignorance of divine things, may in the other case exhibit the ripest fruits of genteel theology and morality, speculation and worship, and the most lofty protest against the cowardice and selfishness with which men elude the legitimate consequences of their own convictions. Sacrifice is either propitiatory, to add strength and perfection to prayer, for a man who raised the Sion, if helio ge mononesin, e de matathasion, Logi, or expiatory, to atone for sin. The former is the most natural, and the classical writers agree that the original sacrifices were of that kind, and there is no trace of expiatory sacrifice in Scripture previous to the Mosaic Law. Yet even propitiatory sacrifice admits of human victims. The best, or first of its kind, was chosen for the altar, and then, as need pressed more sorely, and the true idea of God waxed dim, the child as the most prized possession was given up. Sacrifice was a bargain, in which the thing prayed for were purchased, and the disposition of the sacrificer became less and less an element, till at last the intrinsic value of the thing offered was the only measure of the efficacy of the sacrifice. Thus would arise the notion of sacrificing the child or the slave as the most valuable, and therefore most acceptable, of gifts. For omnium seminum optimum est genus humanum. But before this step could be taken, idolatry must have prevailed and extirpated the memory of the curse of Adam and the idea of the hereditary sinfulness of mankind. For the belief in original sin, for the remission of which, as St. Gregory and St. Thomas say, the patriarchal sacrifices were the provision, seems inconsistent with what probably was the original form of human sacrifice, the immolation of infants. Human sacrifice, however, is more properly expiatory. In the Jewish law, the offerings for sin of ignorance, which included ceremonial mistakes and unconscious defilements, involved the idea that satisfaction had to be made even for acts in which the will had no part, while for conscious transgressions, not only repentance, but an atoning offering was exacted. Among the heathen, the same feeling may have grown up, till the accumulated sense of guilt drove them to seek a means of expiating it. A new idea was introduced into the sacrificial rites, and a victim was sought whose death might have an atoning power to satisfy the justice which was the sovereign attribute of the gods that ruled the world. There was no ministry of grace and mercy in pagan mythology, nothing to teach mankind that the sorrow and amendment of the offender might gain the remission of the penalty of his sin. This idea of a penalty inexorably exacted, without respect for repentance and conversion, is the basis of a system of Christian theology. For Christianity, says Lasalle, as the universal religion, comprehends all that was true in earlier systems, 
and there are few truths explicitly proclaimed in it which are not in substance to be discovered in the pre-Christian world. The famous argument of the Cardaeus Homo of St. Anselm is founded on this theory of satisfaction. The dishonor which sin does to God is not made good by repentance alone. We owe him something more than the return to virtue, but we have nothing to give but what is previously due to him. Yet his honor must be avenged, and his justice vindicated. And this expiation cannot be made by anything else than the death of the God-man, without annulling the eternal justice of God. Yet, even then, adds St. Thomas, he cannot forego inflicting the temporal punishment due to sins, so that even when we have returned to the state of grace, a penalty still remains due. The Catholic doctrine of indulgences is generally based upon that theory of satisfaction, which was philosophically systematized by St. Anselm. The same truth was vaguely present to the heathen conscience. It is expressed by the Aetian aphorism, Hathi Mathos, quote, nothing suffer, nothing learn, unquote. And still more strongly in the lines, Mimni vi minendos en throno theos pa thinton erxanta ves Quote, While Zeus sits on his throne, the law that the doer shall suffer must stand. Unquote. The honor of the gods was engaged. Mankind would cease to believe in them. Ire ton theia. If they allowed sin to go unpunished or accepted unseen contrition as the substitute for the visible penalty. It was not merely a speculative or symbolical, but a juridical truth, that, quote, the wages of sin was death, unquote. There was no other expiation, and human sacrifice, the last and remotest growth of propitiation, was the first and most natural step in expiation. No ordinary sacrifice can redeem the forfeited life of the sinner, or stay the vengeance which his crime may have called down on his family, his city, or his country. His own death will not do it, for his life has become worthless. He and the community whom his guilt has involved must be ransomed by a victim, more pure than he would be. The innocent must die for the guilty, in order that society may escape the just anger of the offended gods. Hence, expiation could not be originally made with less than a human victim, for whom animals, or even mere symbols and tokens, were subsequently substituted. The victim most naturally selected to ransom the guilt of the individual is the child. In the East, the child is also the oldest victim known within the historical period, who had to expiate the guilt contracted by the state. Infant sacrifice was a later introduction into Europe. The idea that children have to bear their parents' guilt, and that the punishment which does not overtake the sinner falls on his descendants, was unknown to Homer. In Greece, it first found expression in Solon. The value of children as victims was that, while they justly suffered for their parent, it was considered that their innocence could at the same time atone for him. If the criminal was to escape, it could only be at the expense of his descendants. To ensure his escape, he must forestall his own punishment by substituting them for himself. Either he or they must suffer for his sins. The myth of the Phoenician Moloch shows that the original cause of the national infant sacrifice was not the guilt of the individual, but the consequent danger to the state. It is chiefly in this aspect that it is found in Greece, where it never became usual, but was only employed to avert some public calamity or expiate some private crime, the guilt of which had rendered the whole city odious to the gods. Here, as the guilt of one was imputed to all, so might the sacrifice of one atone for all. This was only the European idea. Unum pro multis debitor capit. The Asiatic idea was not one for many, but one for one. In other words, of Macrobius, quote, Preceptum est ut pro capitibus capitibus supplicaritur, id que aliquandiu observatum ut pro familiarum sospitate puere macterentur, unquote. As in the family, the child atoned for the father, so in the monarchical state, the king or his daughter was the victim who had to die for the people. Early mythical history is full of such sacrifices. Later on, in republics, a youth or maid was chosen to die for the rest. Thus, in very early times, the more civilized pagans had instituted a sacrifice which, like that of Isaac, was the profoundest sign of the need of a redeemer, and the most solemn and earnest effort which, in default of better knowledge, mankind could make to satisfy that need. 
satisfaction was necessary. Death was the just punishment of sin, and the only satisfaction man could make. Yet a life already forfeited could not be given in ransom. Crushed by the sense of actual guilt and ignorant of original sin, men substituted the most innocent child for their own guilty selves. Thus the deepest ideas of religion possible to the ages of pagan ignorance gave birth to a rite, the more tremendous and apparently efficacious character of which made even the Jews crave after it, in spite of the elements of better knowledge which their law contained. All that we have said on the moral elevation of the practicers of human sacrifice must be understood only of those heathens who still retained a belief in a personal and supreme God. Wherever polytheism had corrupted that belief into pantheism, the right necessarily had another significance. Where God is identified with the animating spirit of the universe, dispersed through infinite space, the macrocosm, and where man is supposed to be a concentrated portion of the same spirit, the microcosm, surpassing the infinite in intensity of mental power, but inferior to it in force and pervasiveness, the idea of prayer and sacrifice, of propitiation and expiation, necessarily becomes changed. Instead of a moral end, its aim becomes cosmical. Instead of religious, it becomes magical. Instead of perfecting prayer, it supersedes prayer. It becomes compulsory and imperative instead of propitiatory and impetrative. It is the blacker charm which compels when the spell of prayer has failed. Instead of expiatory, it becomes medicinal and restorative, like the liver of the murdered child used by Canidia to revive the quenched fires of age. It is the craft whereby man, wiser but weaker than the brute powers of matter, compels them to serve him, compels the moon to shed its vigor-giving influence, the earth to bring forth its fruits, the winds and weather to moderate themselves, and all things to cooperate to human uses. The belief in the sovereign and creative power of sacrifice to influence the powers of the universe reacted on the doctrine of creation and caused it to be mythically represented as a sacrifice. The cosmogonical doctrine of many races was that the world owed its origin to the sacrifice of a primitive living creature, generally represented as human, the different parts of whose body were fashioned by the sacrificing powers into the corresponding portions of the universe. Thus, in the Edda, the three sons of Bor slew Ymir, dragged his body into the midst of the abyss, and of it formed the world. His blood became the waters, his flesh the land, his bones the mountains, and his skull the heavens. In the Vedas, the Rishis formed the world in the same way out of the divided part of Purusha, the primeval man. In Berosus, the woman Amorica served the same purpose. The same belief is found in races which have no connection with the Aryan stock. In Mexico, the primitive man, who was himself formed from a bone sprinkled with the blood of the heroes, threw himself into a fire and became the sun. The moon was afterwards formed in the same way. The mysteries of Greece, Egypt, and Asia represented the cosmogony, or at least the restoration of the world in spring, as the mutilation and new birth of Zagreus, Osiris, Adonis, and Adias. The Persians derived the world from the mutilation of the primitive ox, Abudad. The Finns and the Japanese represent the creation as the breaking of an egg, out of the various portions of which the universe is formed. The New Zealanders have a myth about the creation arising from the forcible and painful separation of heaven and earth, which is not unlike the Hesoidic myth of the mutilation of Uranus. All these myths express the belief that the rite of sacrifice had a demiurgic force over the mundane elements which were compelled by it to serve the needs of man. Now that the victim in this sacrifice was originally man, we have the strongest proof. In two places of the Rig Veda, there are hymns which assert not only the cosmogonical character of the original human sacrifice, but the derivation of all other Vedantic sacrifices from this, and their mere representative and substitutive character. They describe the sacrifice of Purusha, the primeval man, who is identified with the world by the Rishis. From this sacrifice comes Soma, the curdled milk, the butter, the animals, and the Vedantic hymns. That is to say, the materials and rituals of the Vedantic sacrifice are derived from and substituted for the materials and rituals of the Purusha sacrifice. From the parts into which the body of Purusha was divided sprang the four castes, that is to say, the political organization of the Brahmins. Also, from the same division came the different portions of the universe, 
the moon from his heart, the sun from his eyes, fire from his mouth, the wind from his breath, the heaven from his skull, the earth from his feet. Quote, Thus did Rishi form the world. Unquote. Quote, Such, concludes one of the hymns, were the primitive rites. The Rishis, made great by this ceremony, established the heavens. Unquote. The other concludes thus, quote, By that sacrifice, sages and men are formed. Viewing with observant minds this oblation, which primeval saints offered, I venerate them. The seven inspired sages, i.e. the seven priests of the Vedantic ritual, with prayers and thanksgivings, follow the path of these primeval saints, and wisely practice, sacrificing, as charioteers use reins, unquote. That is to say, the same thing that was done by the legendary Rishis when they formed the worlds by the primeval human sacrifice is done by the seven Vedantic priests in their sacrifice of soma, milk, and butter, which are the substitutes for the ancient human victim, and not, as Lacen supposes, the oldest offerings of the Vedantic religion. The horse sacrifice, the mystic power attributed to which is known to English readers by Southley's Kahema, had the same cosmogonical significance. In the last chapter of the Black Jajur Veda, it is said that the divided members of the horse are the parts of time and of the universe. The horse sacrifice is thus, as Lassen says, a representation of the self-sacrifice of Narajena to Viraj, which is merely another form of the Purusha myth. Substitution of one victim for another is the fundamental idea of expiatory and of medicinal or restorative sacrifice. After substituting the sufferings of the innocent child for those of the guilty father, or of the pure maiden for the defiled community, it was only another step to find substitutes for the child or the maiden. Such substitutes were either animals, living vegetables, or intoxicating liquids, soma, which were supposed to partake of the same life which man enjoyed, or portions of his life as contained in his blood, or the foods on which his life were supported, cakes, oil, butter, milk, cooked meat, salt, and the like. Or finally, models and symbols of the victim, dolls, wax figures, and tablets or scraps of paper with diagrams on them. The earliest, most consistent, and most enduring form of human sacrifice concerning which we have definite history is that which was offered to the Assyrian Bel and the Phoenician Moloch, the same nation which led the civilization of Asia and invented the alphabet was the first to reach the phase of religious thought through which, at some period of its progress, all other paganism passed. One of the fathers ascribed to Chaldea the invention of heathen sacrifices, and Dollinger considers Babylon to be the real birthplace and ancient metropolis of paganism and idolatry. There, however, the sacrifice of maiden purity had already been substituted in the time of Herodotus for the bloodier rite. Among the Canaanites, infant sacrifice was prevalent before the period of the Exodus, and is stated to be the reason why God destroyed them and gave their land to his people. It was the characteristic of the Syrian cultus. Most fuit in populus quos condidit avina dido, quos cere cedet deus veneum, ac flagrabantias eris, infandum dictu, parvos imponere netos and it was the purest form of vicarious expiation which nature could suggest. The sinner offers his own flesh and blood, a life of his own life, but, unlike his own, still innocent, and therefore meet to atone for him. The innocence of the victim was the chief requisite, and its healthiness, as the token of innocence, was more indispensable than its blood relationship to him on whose behalf it was offered. The childless might buy children of the poor to sacrifice, but the victims must be sound. Curis et incorruptes. An adult victim could not perfectly correspond to these requirements, nor to the mythological purpose of commemorating the act of Kronos, Moloch, the ancient king and then god of the country, who in a moment of public danger immolated his only son. His worshippers could do no less, nor, as Bunsen says, could quote, Moloch accept less than this, for he had done the same thing himself deliberately and solemnly. Unquote. A thoughtful Swiss writer has pointed out the real significance of the rite. Quote, Le seul vrai sacrifice humain est celui de l'enfant par son père, car l'enfant seul est relativement assez peu pour Marie au lieu d'afficher 
et ses mensonges font aussi de l'âme de celui qui veut apaiser d'eux une douleur aussi profonde procritant de l'enfance parle de nouveau Pouchy qui est général de nouvelles victimes. Unquote. Accordingly, the regular victims were children only. When Gallo made it a condition of peace with the Carthaginians that they should cease to sacrifice their children, he clearly understood these to be the only human victims offered. In the rare cases where men were sacrificed to the Punic gods, the mode of slaughter seems to have been entirely different from that of the children, who were burnt alive in a glowing idol, as described by the Jewish commentators. He who felt the intense significance of the Eastern Rite, Pueni suos soliti dis sacrificare puelos, must have felt how inadequate was the slaughter of an enemy, or a stranger, or a worthless slave, or to express his craving to give his firstborn for his transgression, the fruit of his body for the sin of his soul. Among the Greeks, human sacrifice was gradually extinguished by the advance of civilization. Among the Phoenicians, it extended with the progress of enlightenment. Sangoniathan knows of it only on great occasions, such as that which led to its institution, and only among the royal family. Afterwards, the rite became annual, and on great occasions, it was performed on a vast scale. At Tyre, it had been abolished in very early times, and a proposal to restore it was rejected even when the mole of Alexander threatened the city with destruction. But at Carthage, the custom was never abandoned. And when the victorious army of Agathocles stood before its walls, and it was found that many families had secretly brought other children to sacrifice instead of their own, two hundred children of the best houses were immolated at once to expiate the neglect. But it was necessary that the sacrifice should seem voluntary. As in Sardinia, the captives and old men sacrificed to Baal were compelled to meet their fate with smiles, the famous sardonic grin, so that the terror of Moloch's infant victims was soothed by caresses, its cries drowned with music, and its mother forbidden to weep unless she wished to lose the benefit of the sacrifice. Milton forgot this when he wrote, First Moloch, horrid king, besmeared with blood, of human sacrifice and parents' tears, through the whole noise of drums and timbrels loud, the children's cries unheard, that passed through fire, to his grim idol. It was a great point in such sacrifices. Stometos care proro, phila cancatas gim, frongon areon ikis. The voluntary meekness of the victim, going as a lamb to the slaughter, was so essential that such self devotion rendered even adults fit victims. There is a story of three hundred Carthaginians offering themselves to expiate a crime and ward off a great danger, and it is perhaps from such instances not being very uncommon that Justin was able to say, quote, Homines ut victimus immoleben et impueberes, unquote. The fiery worship of Moloch was carried by the Phoenicians and their colonists to nearly all the coasts of the Mediterranean, but it lost its significance everywhere except at Carthage, where alone the race remained independent. It could only flourish where astrology was supreme, and where the sun was worshipped as the life-giver and the life-destroyer, the god who renewed the earth in spring, burnt it up in summer, and himself suffered in winter, to be restored and to restore the world in spring. These two powers of production and destruction were gathered up in Astari, the goddess of fertility, and Kronos, the devourer of his offspring. Two modes of sacrifice correspond to these ideas, and wherever the Phoenician influence extended, they may be traced in holocausts of human beings and the systematic violation of female virtue. Part 2. The union of bloodshed and licentiousness had one of its roots in the physical philosophy of the old world, which considered generation and destruction, like night and day, to be the necessary and mutually produced succession of being, caused by the eccentric motion of a premium mobile in the elliptic. Thora. The necessary prelude of all production was used in two meanings, destruction by death and pollution. The same philosophy is still exemplified in the Indian rites of Siva, Kali, and Juggernath. The notion of the physical productivity of sacrifice may be connected with the idea of Empedocles, that flesh and bone were the simple elements and the universal germs, Panspadamia, of earth, water, and air. And this accounts for the intimate connection between human sacrifice and agriculture. In another aspect, the passage from the slaughter of the innocent victim to the ruin of the innocence 
which gave it its value was strictly logical as the spilling of blood was substituted in so many cases for the sacrifice of the life that was in the blood so the destruction of innocence was substituted for the sacrifice of the innocent without any original reference to the hatefulness of the means by which the substitution was made but simply on the principle that instead of the victim itself that which gave it value might be sacrificed but there is also an ethical relationship between the two acts expressed in the verb therein. Leaving the general question to moralists and psychologists, we may observe that, with whatever indifference men might have sacrificed captives, criminals, or slaves, they could not cast their children into the fire without feeling that they were tearing out a fiber, as it were, of their own selves, or without awakening an unnatural frenzy, which might easily lead them to gloat over destruction, and to invert the right impulses of humanity, precisely in the same way as the frenzy of sensuality does. The union of the two frenzies is shown in the self-mutilating orgists of Sibel and Adias. Immoral rites and inhuman ceremonies are cognate and corresponding caricatures of the true ideas of worship and of love. Thus, human sacrifice was the turning point at which paganism passed from morality to wickedness. The highest possible effort at expiation became the natural source of unnatural practices and ideas. The human victim was put to death as a substitute for the conversion and purification of the sinner, and a door was opened for the rites in which all distinction of virtue and vice was ignored, and sin itself was often made meritorious. Sapius Ilia, Religio Paperet Sclerosa, Atque Impia Facta. At this stage, even the indistinct and ignorant worship of God, which had survived in polytheism, was abandoned, and that of other powers usurped its place. It is this distinction between the pure and more corrupt paganism which accounts for the opposite views taken of it by theologians. The Jews and early Christians, who saw paganism in its last stage of degradation, universally believed that its gods were devils. In the Bible, this identity is not distinctly expressed. Sometimes the gods are said to have had no real existence, sometimes to be demons. The same Hebrew word is translated by the Seventy in three ways, demons, idols, and vanities. St. Paul is careful not to assert the real existence of the gods, while he says that the devils receive the homage offered to them. The early fathers understood that these gods were actual devils. Justin Martyr, who with all the Antinicene fathers but one, interprets Genesis 6, 2, of sinful angels, holds that their offspring were the demons who became heathen gods and actually existed in the form represented by the idols and perpetrated all the crimes recorded in mythology. St. Augustine believed that the gods were real devils, who usurped the place of God in order to enjoy the homage due to him, and intercept the prayers and sacrifices intended for him. But this opinion, in its sweeping universality, has not held its ground among Christian philosophers and divines. Yet the character of certain rites is so distinctly diabolical as to confirm the belief that in these cases particular demons both inspired and received the abominable worship. When paganism had reached this development, all that had mitigated or redeemed its demoralizing influence at once disappeared. They could no longer soften manners, uphold the sanctity of law, tame pride and passion, or inculcate reverence for the past or care for the future. All those social and political influences which distinguished the religions of Greece, Persia, and Rome were lost, and the degraded worship became the poison of morality and the enemy of civilization and every pagan religion exhibited such a phase when the old belief was disintegrated and when the powers which had gradually led men away from god seemed finally to have usurped his place this phase has not always coincided with the period of lowest national decline because in some favored countries an intellectual reaction has transformed a perishing religion or skepticism has delivered men from its thraldom Quote, quum et politores Amines et minos creduli esse cooperant. But wherever there was no such intellectual revival to produce a conflict between the awakened reason and the degenerating tradition, and wherever error pursued its blindfold course unchecked by great lawgivers like those of India, Persia, and China, or by culture like that of the classic world, there the horrors of paganism developed themselves helplessly so the only remedy was the strong hand of an imperial administration, as in Gaul, the extermination of the priesthood, as in Britain, or the destruction of the race itself, as in Central America. There is no other natural term. 
the orgies of the Syrian Venus were revived at fixed intervals in the Lebanon down to the 19th century. Greece presents a contrast to the unvarying East in the modifications which a people of restless temper and sharp intellect introduced into the original idea of human sacrifice, and in the rapidity with which the right passed through all phases of progress and decline. The stubborn consistence and unreflecting conservatism of the Punic race converted religious earnestness into a demoralizing influence, while the unstable indifference, the keen vital enjoyment, and the intellectual liberty of the Greek soon made the rigid ceremonial of expiation conform to the feelings of a civilization in which religion was not the only, and sometimes not the most powerful, of the influencing forces. Without questioning that human sacrifice was indeed the most efficacious of offerings, the Greek felt that it was connected with a more earnest religion, a more cheerless theology, a more mystical philosophy, than that which belonged to the fantastic and poetical world of Greek mythology. He never lost sight of the foreign and barbarous origin of the rite. It was strange and unhallowed, alien from Hellenic manners. Heracles, who represents their influence, suppressed it in Italy. The chorus in Euripides condemns the sacrifice of Iphigenia, and Herodotus calls the sacrifice of two Egyptian boys by Menelaus to obtain a fair wind and an holy act. Riga muk osion. Escalese and Herodotus are the earliest writers who mention it, and from the first it is regarded with fear and aversion. The mythology of Greece knew nothing of propitiatory human sacrifice, in which the victim is offered up as a better kind of animal. The myth of Pelops was referred to Phrygia. Neither legends nor histories know of human victims, except an expiation of offenses that had drawn down public calamities, and even then it was desired that the act should be the victim's own, and that he who died for thousands should die cheerfully, and then there was little need of any religious rite. The centaur, Chiron, whom one authority calls the inventor of sacrifice, was the earliest mythological personage who gave up his life to ransom another, when he resigned his immortality in favor of Prometheus. The daughters of Orion volunteered to die when the oracle declared that a pestilence could only be averted from Anoia by the voluntary deaths of two maidens. So Macaria and the daughters of Erechtheus and Cordus and Cretinus in historic times died for Attica. At Thebes, the king's son slew himself in obedience to the prophecy of Tiresias. Even the death of Leonidas was counted among voluntary sacrifices. Now in all these cases the responsibility was thrown upon the oracles, or upon the gods. Not one is represented as proceeding from the customs of the people. The right could not long subsist in this pure form. The dread of it, which at first made the Greeks ascribe it to the direct command of their gods, and require the victim to be a voluntary one, soon led to further changes, which portended its gradual but sure extinction. For when once the rigid consistency of the original Moloch worship was abandoned, an opening was given for the irresistible influence of civilization and humanity, of religious skepticism, and the sense of men's social and moral rights. The First Amendment was to select the victim by lot. The idea grew naturally from the democratic institutions of Athens, but its earliest victim was the daughter of Aristodemus in the First Mycenaean War. The next change was to give the victim a chance to escape. The oracle had decreed that to expiate the violence offered to Cassandra, for a thousand years two Locrian virgins should be annually sent to Troy, where they were sacrificed, unless they could escape into the temple of Pallas. At Athens, the rite soon degenerated. Two poor persons were annually sacrificed for the people. The same usage prevailed in other places, but instead of the spotless and voluntary victim, first a slave or a captive, and afterwards an animal, was slaughtered with the consent of the god, or blood was drawn without destruction of life, or the victim was slain in effigy. Yet, in spite of the horror which devised all these modes of evading the right, we find traces of it throughout almost the whole Hellenic world, in the cultus of almost every god, and in all periods of their independent history. There is no nation says La Salle, of which more numerous or more various sacrifices of human victims are recorded. Gerhard has classified the instances geographically and assigned them to their respective myths. In the middle of the 4th century BC, Plato speaks of the rite as a common custom, and is not entirely abolished even at the beginning of the Christian era. Yet the Greek religion could never be thoroughly harmonized with making the present life unhappy to secure enjoyment in the next, and with atoning for all evil actions by voluntary suffering. 
which is the natural development of the doctrine of expiation by sacrifice. A system, then, which enacts bloody sacrifices without providing for the lower grades by inculcating self-imposed penance, moral discipline, and self-denial, is mutilated and inconsistent. The idea of expiation requires more than a substituted victim. It is but a superficial theology which would exempt the sinner from any effort beyond that of providing a vicarious sufferer. But the Greek idea, at least in historic times, was never properly theological, for the victim did not wash away the guilt of the individual, but only warded off the consequences of sin from the community. And these consequences remained after the guilt was washed away. Orestes, though purified of his mother's blood, was still pursued by the Furies. It was not the conscience of guilt, but the terror of its consequences, which overcame the humanity of the Greeks. Where this terror found no place, there, instead of the human victims, which other nations offered, they contented themselves with hecatombs of animals, and with the mysteries which unquestionably satisfied those religious cravings that in other places could only be appeased by human sacrifice. But in Rome, where religion was more real, the awe of the gods greater, the view of life more earnest and gloomy, and morals more severe, human sacrifice was less hateful to the popular mind. There was no horror of bloodshed in the national character, and no provision for substituting an easier atonement for human victims in the religious ritual. The deification of the state made every sacrifice which it exacted seem as nothing in comparison with the fortune of Rome, and the perils which for centuries menaced it from Carthage or Gaul, Epirus or Pontus, Parthia, Spain or Germany, each demanded its human victims. There are but few records of the sentiments of the earlier Romans. The bulk of their literature belongs to the age of universal empire, when the people dwelt securely in the capital of the world, thinking only of distant conquest, and when their religion had lost its local and national character. As Prudentius says, Roma antiqua sibi non costat, versa per avem et mutata sacris, or natu legibus armis. Mota coli, qui non coli sob regi corino, instituit qui dam melius non nulla refugit, et morem variare situm non desinit, et que pridem conditerat jura in contraria vertit, quid mihi tu rito solitos, Romane senator, objectas cum scita patrum populic frequenter, instabilis ositi sententia flexa novarit. When the fullness of time was at hand, the energy of the old belief was broken, and the decomposition of the national religion was first manifested in its effects on that right which was its highest and most forcible expression. Those substitutions were adopted which became, to after ages, the proof of the earlier prevalence of human sacrifice, while the Etruscan influence was strong. Resemblances, as Servius says, were taken for realities. The name was held to be as good as the thing. Dolls were flung into the Tiber instead of men, and it was pretended that the animals which were sacrificed were human beings transformed. Human sacrifices were first prohibited in the Republic, B.C. 95, and, quote, For some time, says Pliny, the open celebration of the monstrous rite was unheard of, unquote. But as Salik says on the passage, Pliny can only have meant that human sacrifice for magical purposes ceased as he must have known that men continued to be publicly offered for other causes down to his own times. The few traces that remain prove that the magical rite was still practiced, though in secret and with shame, whilst human victims continued to be publicly immolated for other ends, till they also were prescribed by the law. Augustus interdicted all Roman citizens from partaking in the inhuman rites of the Druids, whose sacrifices were suppressed by Claudius in Gaul and by Suetonius in Britain. In the sentences of Julius Pallas, written in the beginning of the 3rd century, we find a law making it a capital offense to offer a human sacrifice, either secretly or in a temple. This must be drawn from the Edict of Hadrian, to which many later writers attribute the extinction of the practice. But the belief in the magical or atoning efficacy of human blood grew, under the influence of Oriental priests, with the increasing stringency of the law that forbade it and human victims perished long after the decree of the year 97 B.C., and in defiance even of the Edict of Hadrian. In the year 63 B.C., Catiline and his accomplices sacrificed a boy, and ratified the oath they had taken over his bleeding body by eating his flesh. 
Seven years later, Cicero publicly accused Valentinius of offering up human victims to the infernal gods. Juvenal speaks of similar practices under the Flavian Caesars, and Justin Martyr under the Antonines. In the times of Marcus Aurelius, Aristides, the rhetorician, who had been for many years afflicted with an incurable disease, and as a priest of Aesculapius, was used to receive in his sleep directions from the god, through which he had hoped for a cure, learnt one day, when he felt himself better, that his foster brother, Hermias, had just sacrificed his own life to save him. A sister, Philomenia, remained, to whom he was affectionately attached, but he was warned by the god that unless she died he could not live. Cosabon understands Aristides to say that she also was sacrificed. He for whom they died published the facts to the world in his sacred orations. While the Roman people were restrained by the law, and by a horror still more effective, was practiced by their rulers without fear or disguise, in every generation of the four centuries from the fall of the Republic to the establishment of Christianity, human victims were sacrificed by the emperors. In the year 46 BC, Julius Caesar, after suppressing a mutiny, caused one soldier to be executed, while at the same time, two others were sacrificed by the Flamen of Mars on the altar in the Campus Martius. The historian is careful to distinguish the religious rite from the military execution, and there are many reasons against supposing that the priest could have been a common executioner. Five years later, when Perugia was taken, Octavian sacrificed 300 senators and knights to his deified predecessor, and the altars of Perugia became a proverb. In the same age, Sextus Pompeius flung captives into the sea as a sacrifice to his father, Neptune. Augustus sacrificed a maiden named Gregoria and buried her beneath the walls of Ancyra. Another, Antigone, was sacrificed by Tiberius when he built the theater of Antioch. When Germanicus died, his house was found to be lined with charms, images, and bones of men whom Tiberius had sacrificed to the infernal gods to hasten his end. Augustus had refused to let a senator offer his life to prolong the days of the emperor, but Caligula compelled one to die, who, having thus devoted himself, shrank at the last moment from consummating the sacrifice. Nero, by the advice of the astrologers, put many nobles to death to avert from himself the evils with which a comet threatened him. Trajan, when he rebuilt Antioch, sacrificed the beautiful Calliope and placed her statue in the theater. In the next reign, Antoninus offered himself up for Hadrian. Commodus sacrificed a man to Mithra. Didius Julianus offered sacrifices of children, and Caracalla sacrificed human victims in the temple of Serapis. Telegalibus sacrificed children according to the Syrian rites, and Valerian, in obedience to an Egyptian magician. Aurelian, when the frontiers were threatened by the Macromani, ordered the sacred books to be opened, and declared that from every nation victims must be supplied for the altars. At the beginning of the 4th century, Maxentius divined the future by sacrificing infants and opening the bodies of pregnant women. The same rites were practiced by Julian the Apostate. After his death, the body of a woman was found hanging by the hair in a temple at Carre. He had inspected her entrails to divine the issue of his campaign, and his palace at Antioch was filled with the corpses of human victims. In the year 371, the tribune, Polinantius, confessed that he had sacrificed a woman to the infernal gods in the hope of compassing the destruction of Valens. The instances recur with a uniformity which proved the practice to have been habitual. The un-Roman rite of burying alive a man and woman of the nation with which Rome was at war, described by Livy, survived to the days of the elder Pliny. Children were publicly sacrificed to Moloch in Africa until the middle of the second century. The Romans had crucified the priests on the trees around the temple, but the rite was not extinct in the time of Tertullian. Eusebius, indeed, believed that the Edict of Hadrian had effected its purpose, but Porphyry speaks as if human sacrifices lasted until the close of the 3rd century. But it is unnecessary to prove the Romans' practice so circumstantially, when in fact the combats of gladiators were a form of the rite, in which the religious idea still survived beneath the secularity of the spectacle. At first, these shows were celebrated for the souls of the dead, like the games which Achilles united with the sacrifice of prisoners at the funeral of Patrocles. At the death of Junius Brutus, the victims furnished by the Gentes were so numerous that they were made to fight together and kill each other, thus converting the rite into a spectacle.
the gods in whose honor these games were held, was the same who devoured his children. In two places, combats distinctly religious in character survived to a very late period. Under Marcus Aurelius, the candidates for the priesthood of Diana at Archaea fought at her temple, and the survivor obtained it. And on the same Alban Mount, a gladiator was annually sacrificed to Jupiter Latiaris until the time of Constantine. But though the Romans were not too civilized to endure the spectacle of wholesale massacre, in which the memory of a religious origin was dimmed by the splendor of the unholy festivity, yet they retained too little of the old spirit to tolerate an inhuman rite, the object of which was simply religious. Yet a people in whom unbelief was counterbalanced by superstition, and who were familiar with bloodshed, required no more than the example of their emperors and the incentives of magic and of the Phoenician and Celtic worship to confirm them in a taste for sacrifices, for which slavery supplied the victims and secured impunity. The practice defied the laws of the empire and ceased only with the downfall of paganism. Among the barbarians, it survived still longer and resisted even the preaching of the Christian faith. The human sacrifices of the Druids may have begun in cannibalism, Strabo says that the Celts of Gaul and Spain were taught by famine to eat human flesh, and he cites a rumor that it was the ordinary practice in Ireland. Diodorus confirms the report, and St. Jerome, in the middle of the 4th century, was an eyewitness of the cannibalism of the British people, who picked out the choicest morsels with gluttonous relish. Salinas shows the connection between this unnatural custom and the religious rite when he speaks of the Irish drinking the blood of their victims. There are indications of the progress in Druidism from an earlier period, when such barbarous customs were widely spread in the race, to its high development in the age of Caesar. The intermediate phase is shown in a practice out of harmony with the latest form, which had died out not long before the conquest of Gaul, that of burning the clients and slaves of the deceased, together with all that had been most useful to him, that is, funeral. Two centuries before Caesar, the Gauls strove to atone for their offenses against the gods by the sacrifice of innocent human victims. Thus, in their wars against Antigonus, they offered up their wives and children to expiate the menaces of the adverse omens. And Cicero says that any fear led them to offer human sacrifices to avert the peril. On this idea, the later Druidic sacrifices, which so horrified the skeptical Romans, were founded. First, the notion that each man brought himself off by substituting another, and criminals were kept in prison to be thus immolated, for private persons had no right to sacrifice the innocent. But in the public sacrifices, when the supply of criminals was insufficient, then, in the interest of all, the innocent might be slain. And when the occasion was exceptional, as when the plague visited Marseilles, the atoning victim was not chosen from amongst the criminals, but some poor and harmless man voluntarily offered his life, and on to his head, after he had been maintained for a year at the public expense, the woes of the city were solemnly transferred, and he was thrown into the sea. For the ordinary quinquennial sacrifices, however, enemies and criminals were reckoned sufficient. They were massacred in various ways. Some were crucified, some pierced with arrows, and large numbers burnt in one heap with the firstlings of various kinds. These were not expiatory sacrifices, but propitiatory thank-offerings of the earliest and simplest type, and men were offered as the best victims, not in kind, but in degree. The divination sometimes connected with the rite was not its primary object. The Druids inspected the victims to augur how the gods had accepted him. Great authorities have concluded from Lucian's lines, Et quibius imitis placator sanguine dero. Tutetis, Forensque Ferris, Altaribus Jesus, et Terranus Scythicae, non Meteor Eradiani, that men were sacrificed to all the principal Celtic gods. This, however, would have been inconsistent with the refining subtlety of the Druidic theology, and we have not sufficient warrant in the classics for the notion. Tertullian and Nucius Felix know of human sacrifices only of their chief god, Mercury, Tutetis. Zeus argues that men must have been sacrificed to Mars, Jesus, if they were offered to Apollo, but Diodorus does not mention it in his account of the cultus of Apollo, and Caesar omits men from his catalogue of the offerings made to Mars. Perhaps, however, the victims slain before battle were offered to Mars, 
to whom, as well as Mercury, Lactantius says that men were sacrificed. Part 3 The Teutonic Odin, whom the Romans identified with the Celtic Teutates, likewise exacted human victims. But the Germans offered such sacrifices before the time what we hear of Odin. Caesar, who thought that they had no personal gods, relates that they thrice determined by lot whether they should sacrifice a Roman prisoner. It seems to have been long their custom to let the gods thus select the victim. Thirty years later, before fighting with Marcus Crassus, the Pannonians vowed they would sacrifice and devour the officers they captured. In their wars with the Cimbri, the Romans believed that the prisoners whom they lost would be sacrificed. The Gete, who deemed death better than life, and mourned their birthday, buried the widows with the husband. So did the Heruli, down to the 6th century. In the early times, however, before the struggle with the empire, the idea of sacrifice was undeveloped in the German mind. But the mythology of the ruthless Odin, which arose during the migrations and expeditions of the Northmen, found in these ancient customs the nucleus of its sanguinary cultus, and elevated the slaughter of captives and widows into a religious rite. In the times described by Tacitus, the thoughtless barbarity of a nation of warriors coexisted with the religious notions to which it afterwards gave way. The officers of the army of Varus were slain upon the altars, and in the wars between the Hermundri and the Chatti, the vanquished were sacrificed to Mercury and Mars. The slaughter of captives was gradually softened down, probably by being more and more assimilated into a religious rite. At first, the officers captured were slain. Later on, the Saxons, the most cruel of the German tribes, decimated their prisoners. The daily sacrifice of a Christian Roman by Radagascus was an unusual act of mingled ferocity and fanaticism. The practice was one of the great obstacles which Christianity had to overcome among the Germans. In the time of St. Boniface, Christians sold their serfs to the pagans of the Baltic for sacrifice. The Saxons must have clung to the right even after their conversion, for it is punished with death in the very next paragraph of Charlemagne's Capitularies, to that which makes the refusal of baptism a capital crime. The Franks practiced it long after the death of Clovis. In their Italian invasion of 539, they sacrificed the women and children of the Goths on the bridge of Pavia. Procopius enumerates it among the relics of the paganism which they retained. For like the Saxons and the Hessians, they were converted, not when their national paganism had become a listless and decrepit form, but while it was in all the energy of expanding vigor, and the resistance of the priests of Odin to the Christian champions, left profound impressions on the idea and forms of the German church. The gods were too keenly loved and believed in to be rejected as mere creatures of the imagination. The missionaries did not believe them to be all illusions, and they considered those gods which were worshipped within human rights to be really infernal spirits. This belief of the primitive church was forced upon the clergy, who did battle against the paganism of northern Europe, by signs which the theology of ancient Rome did not afford. It was admitted, then, that the German gods were real beings, not divine, however, but devilish. The substance was carefully distinguished from the attributes and those qualities, which were not inconsistent with Christian morality, were transferred to the saints. Churches were built on the sites of the heathen sanctuaries, and dedicated to the saint whose legend bore most resemblance to the myth of the dispossessed deity. A strange fusion ensued. The fallen gods were not believed to be powerless, because they were demons, and their anger had been provoked to the utmost by the destruction of their altars. Thus the images of Perun at Novgorod, broke out into a loud lament for the faithlessness of its ungrateful worshippers, when it was thrown down and dragged to the river. It might still be prudent, therefore, to conciliate the deposed and dishonored deities so far as was compatible with the newly adopted faith. Thus, a mass of superstition clustered round the old divinities, and they survived in many a legend of the wild huntsman, or the cave of Venus, or the spirits of the mountain and stream peopling with supernatural figures the minstrelsy of the Middle Ages and our own fairy and nursery tales. But pagan reminiscences not only created and supplied one whole moiety of this dualistic tendency, but also penetrated into the conception of Christianity. Figures in human shape were carried about on certain festivals, in memory of the forbidden victims, and sacrifices were offered in the 8th century to the saints 
these abuses were rigidly put down by the church, but she tolerated a species of accommodation, of which two remarkable memorials remain. One is a Saxon poem of the ninth century, in which the gospel is translated into a kind of Teutonic legend, and our Lord represented as a German warrior king, surrounded by his faithful liegemen. The other is a poem of southern Germany, and of the same date, in which the apocalyptic vision is related with the names and scenery of the Edo. Long after the worship of Odin was extinct in Germany, it was flourishing enough in Scandinavia to put forth a new theology. For centuries, the fierce Northmen were ceaselessly battling against the Christian nations along the ocean coasts, and in the violence of the struggle, their religious rights and their social character grew more and more savage. Prodigal of others' blood and reckless of their own, they afforded a congenial soil for the plant of human sacrifice, which put forth some of its rankest shoots, just as paganism was about to fail. The native tradition assigns the origin of the rite to the remotest antiquity and makes it prevalent among the Northmen from their first appearance among the nations. It was Frey, the second king after Odin, who, in a period antecedent to all chronology, changed the primitive rite and instituted human sacrifice. Man was the noblest victim, and therefore the first prisoner taken in any expedition was offered up to the god of war. These sacrifices, which were perhaps partly an artifice of the priesthood to mitigate the horrors of war and prevent the general massacre of prisoners, lasted as long as paganism itself, and in the most various forms. There was a regular form of imprecation to devote the enemy to Odin before the battle. In 893, the Jarl of the Orkneys sacrificed the son of the king of Norway, and offered up his lungs to Odin, and then compassed a war song in memory of his deed. Harold Hildetand, in return for Odin's protection in battle, promised him all the souls that his sword should separate from their bodies. The Swedish regent, Eric, vowed to sacrifice himself to Odin at the end of ten years if he gained the victory over the Danes. In 993, Hakon Jarl, the hero of Ohenschlager's powerful drama, Though he had been baptized, offered all kinds of victims to ensure the success of his arms, but could only propitiate the gods by the sacrifice of his son. The delay of an expedition, by contrary winds, was occasion enough for the sacrifice, and a Norwegian king was chosen by lot to die for this cause. It was not unusual to compel the king to die for his people. There was a famine in Sweden in the reign of Domaud. In the first year, oxen were sacrificed at Uppsala. In the second, men, and in the third, the king was immolated, and the altar smeared with his blood. Another scarcity, under Olave Tretelja, being attributed, like all other evil, or good, to the influence of the king, who was sparing in his sacrifices, his house was surrounded, and he was burnt in it, as a sacrifice to Odin. A mythical king of Uppsala was promised ten years additional life for each of his sons that he sacrificed. One Icelander is even related to have offered his son that he might have grace to find a tree to serve as a column in a temple. These narratives, though of no value as records of events, prove how familiar was the rite to the Scandinavian mind, for there were certain fixed solemnities at which human victims were sacrificed, and traces of the custom, as Bishop Munter tells us, may still be found in the soil of all three Scandinavian kingdoms. In Denmark, Ninety-nine victims were sacrificed every ninth year till the beginning of the 10th century. A similar rite existed at Uppsala till the middle of the 11th, and Christians were obliged to purchase exemption by a fine. One of them told Adam of Bremen that he had seen 72 bodies hanging at one time. In Iceland, and probably in the other kingdoms, the usual victims were condemned criminals. Owing to the efforts of the missionaries to save the victims, this horrible rite figures in the history of the planting of the church in several countries. Sometimes a strange mixture is seen. In the laws of Friesland, after many enactments entirely Christian in character, the code ends with punishing sacrilege by immolation. Immolator sacrilegius dis quorum templa vuela vit. Christianity coexisted with paganism for some time among the Frisians, who were much scandalized at being told by St. Wolfram that they would not meet their ancestors in heaven. While this saint was preaching, a youth named Ovo was once led forth to be sacrificed. Wolfram interceded for him, and was told that the victim should be his slave if his god would save him. Wolfram prayed, 
and the rope by which Ovo was hanging broke, and let him fall to the ground. He declared that he had been half asleep, and felt as if he were held up by the saint's girdle. Upon this, great numbers were baptized, and the rescued victim became a priest, and died in 749 at the Abbey of Fontenelle. The demonical possession so frequent in the Gospels often broke out with similar frequency and intensity in countries where the Gospel was being preached for the first time. So it was with human sacrifice. In the final conflict of paganism, it was the most signal proof of the intense tenacity of error and of the power of the heathen gods over their worshippers, and at the same time, the most flagrant act of defiance and contradiction to the new teaching. It was, as it were, the demonical possession of paganism. No system which had once admitted it ever cast it out by natural and esoteric progress, though it sometimes disappeared with the diminished energy of belief or by the conquest of another system. In the reign of King Olave Tragvason, the Christian scout, Halfred of Tarsen, narrowly escaped immolation among the heathens of Gothland. In Iceland, the struggle between the new faith and the old was arduous. Olave endeavored to enforce baptism, and the pagans insisted that he should sacrifice to the gods like his predecessors. In 999, he promised the Norwegians to do so, and declared that, to propitiate the gods whom he had deserted, he would offer the most splendid sacrifice ever known, where the victims, instead of slaves and malefactors, should be chosen from the Norwegian chiefs. In 1000, the heathen party in Iceland resolved to sacrifice two men from each province to defend them against Christianity. The Christians answered the challenge by two men of each province devoting their lives to religion, as nobler victims to obtain the conversion of their country. This is the last instance of human sacrifice among the Northmen. The memory of the barbarous rite long survived among their descendants. Dudo of St. Quentin and William of Jumiege and Roger Wace, who borrowed from them the subject of his poem, probably did not know that the ancient rites which they described had been continued almost down to their time. Chaparri, the profoundest scholar of the Slavonic world, gives, in his Slavonic antiquities, an idyllic picture of the primitive manners of the race. They were not barbarians, as the Germans described them, nor restless warlike adventurers, like the Germans themselves. Their happiness was in the peaceful cultivation of the soil, and it was their expulsion of the Germanic tribes from the rich plains of the Vistula, which gave the first impulse to the great migrations. They were civilized, humane, and free, in spite of the Russian writers, who maintained that the natural condition of the people is one of oppression and servitude. In consonance with this cheerful description, Chaparik affirms that human sacrifice was unknown to the great Slavonic race, or only transiently introduced by strangers, among some of the northern tribes. His patriotism was incapable of acknowledging that human sacrifice, in various forms, not only prevailed in the race, but continued in spite of Christianity. Perhaps we may say by reason of the conflict with Christianity, down to a period when it had long disappeared throughout the rest of Europe. One type of it, common to all the nations from the Baltic to the Altai Mountains, is described by Herodotus in his account of the funeral of a Scythian king. One of his wives and many of his servants were compelled to share his grave, together with his horses and precious vessels, and the first fruits of all products. After a year, fifty men and horses were slain and stuffed and set round the monument as guards. The Scythians gashed and wounded themselves in presence of the royal corpse. The ruling idea was that the king was deified by death, and that the gods were no other than the dead. They were supplied, therefore, with all that was most needful to them, in order to continue an existence not very different from that which they had lost. The sacrifice of deposition was for use, the anniversary one for honor. This notion of providing the dead monarch with attendance was capable of an indefinite extension, and led, in a subsequent age, to some of the most appalling scenes in the sanguinary annals of Central Asia. The wounding of the survivors, and the offering of the first fruits, seem to point to a distinct order of ideas, and indicate a more spiritual conception of divinity and sacrifice. The earliest notice of similar customs among the Slavonic people in the Middle Ages is furnished by St. Boniface in the year 745 among the Wends. Quote, Prodicimus et deterimum genus ominum, unquote. 
the widows refused to survive their husbands, but slew themselves to be burnt with them. Quote, Tam magno zelo matrimoni amorum mutum servant. Unquote. If the practice had sprung from pure attachment, it would have indicated the existence of sentiments highly favorable to the adoption of Christianity, whereas, being a religious rite, it proved to be a stubborn support of paganism. Three hundred years later, the Wends, though spoken of very favorably by the Catholic clergy, still shed human blood upon their altars. All their sacrifices were expiatory, and all therefore were bloody. They made no difference in kind between human and animal sacrifices nor did they understand that bullocks or sheep might be offered up vicariously for human victims. These were selected from Christian captives. One was sacrificed every year, and on great occasions, large numbers suffered a lingering death. Dithmar, Bishop of Mersburg, who died in 1018, does not particularize the victims as specially Christian. Quote, Hominum ac sanguine percutum, infallibus horum, theorum, furor mitigar, unquote. But Helmold, who wrote toward the end of the year 1168, is only of Christian victims. Quote, Mectanticu dis suis hostias de bobos et ovibus, cleric etium de omnibus, Christianus enuatum omnum Christicolum, letari consuevarunt. Unquote. It seems, therefore, that the original notion of human sacrifice was extinct and that the practice was kept alive down to the twelfth century only by the antagonism to Christianity. As practiced among the ancient Prussians, human sacrifice exhibits far higher notions of theology than the ordinary immolation of prisoners and slaves. Not only captives, but children, and the priests themselves, were sacrificed to the god Patrimpos. A perpetual fire burnt before his sacred oak, and the supreme reward of the priests was to perish in its hallowed flames. If it was allowed to go out, the priest who was responsible was burnt as soon as it was lighted again. The priest was mediator between mankind and the gods. When he grew old, he mounted a pyre and exhorted the people to desert their evil ways, and if they professed sorrow, he caused the logs to be set on fire and offered himself up in satisfaction for their sins. But the rite lost much of its religious significance and became a mere act of vengeance and ferocity during the long warfare with the Teutonic Knights. A Christian, who approached the holy places, was put to death in order to appease the outraged gods. Before an expedition, a captive belonging to the hostile nation was slaughtered in order to ascertain its result. A practice resembling that which, according to Livy and Pliny, prevailed for centuries in Rome. Prisoners taken in battle were put to death with solemn rites, and the sword of the warriors were dipped in their blood. Maidens were crowned with flowers and slain. Commanders were burnt with their horses. A knight of the order was sacrificed in this way in the year 1261, and another so late as 1320. This is the latest instance of the rite in the history of European paganism, and it is almost entirely stripped of its original religious character. The Estonians exhibited the same ferocity against the Christian enemy. In 1221, they sacrificed a Danish captive, and devoured his heart in order to give themselves courage for the fray. But they were not content with the victims they could obtain in war. A regular trade was carried on, by which Christian slaves were supplied for their altars, and nobles used to sell their serfs for this purpose. The classic historian of Poland tells us that the heathen Poles occasionally sacrificed enemies taken in war, and adds that the rites were accompanied by those acts which in Asia and America though not in northern Europe, seem almost inseparable from the sacrifice of human beings. In Russia, it cannot be proved that human sacrifices were known before the Waragian conquest, but in the 10th century there were many gods to whom parents sacrificed their children. We know no other case in which the rite was practiced promiscuously, without distinguishing the deity to whom it was specially grateful. Sacrifices to the dead are described with great fullness by an Arabian writer, who was sent by the caliph in the year 921 to convert the Russians to Islam. A man of note having died, his family asked who would die with him. A girl of his house volunteered, and the particulars of her death are remarkable, for they are described by an eyewitness. It is evident that matrimonial affection had as little to do with it as the idea of expiation, for the victim is not the wife, and she exclaims, quote, 
My Lord calls me, so take me to him, unquote, and speaks not a word about the gods, but dies solely to be the company of the dead. On the other hand, we are strongly reminded of the Phoenician rites when we read that the men beat their shields in order to drown her cries, and that a scene of cold debauchery immediately preceded her death. On the 12th of July, the Russians still commemorate the festival of Theodore and Ewain, the only martyrs of the church at Kiev. Their legend is connected with the last human sacrifice recorded of the pagan Russians. Five years before their conversion in 983, Vladimir proposed to celebrate his victories in Galatia by offering up the usual human victims to the gods. The lot fell on his son, a Waragian, who had been converted at Constantinople. He refused to deliver him up and denounced the false gods of the people, who thereupon slew both father and son. The Russian church soon canonized them, and has continued to venerate them ever since. The memory of the blood he has shed haunted Vladimir after his baptism, and great disorders were caused by the mildness of his later rule. He feared to provoke the anger of God if he destroyed a human life, and the clergy were compelled to admonish him that severity was an important duty of kings. The conversion of the people did not deliver the soil of Russia from the horrors of human sacrifice. It was universally practiced by the Tartars, says Mikhond, but apparently only at the burial of chieftains, and not in honor of the divinity. Those who dug the grave of Attila were immediately slain in order that that place might be concealed from the knowledge of mankind. One hundred years later, a similar custom prevailed among the Turks, but with a somewhat deeper significance. Turxanthus slew, together with his father's horses, four captive Huns at his grave bidding them inform him of the state of his affairs. At the death of Genghis Khan, forty maidens followed him to the other world, and, in order that the secret might be kept, his followers slew all whom they met while carrying his body from the place where he died on the Hong Ho to the sepulchre of the Khans in the Altai. Marco Polo says that this became the regular practice thenceforward at the funeral of the Khans, and that the victims were told that they must go to serve their master in the other world. When Mengu died in 1259, many thousand corpses marked the passage of his funeral procession across the plains of Tartary. The favorite wife of Akte died upon his grave, and maidens covered with jewels were buried with Hulagu. The long and arduous struggle of the gentler religion of Buddha against this ancient rite has been recorded by one of the descendants of Genghis. In 1578, it was forbidden to destroy even horses or camels at funerals. Nevertheless, when Alten Kong Han lost his only son, the mother of the boy, regardless of the sin, says the Mongol historian, ordered one hundred children to be slaughtered as companions for her child. More than forty perished when the threats of the people put an end to the massacre. The guilt of the mother caused strange things to befall when she was dead. The devil would not abandon the corpse and made it move in horrible imitation of real life. The Bagda Lama invoked the most awful of the gods. The upper garment of the dead was laid in a triangular grave, into which the Bagda Lama also flung as many passing demons as he could catch, whereupon a lizard appeared. The Bagda Lama then discoursed so impressively on inevitable death that the creature, having bowed its head three times, gave up the ghost. Then the garment and the lizard were consumed by fire, from which proceeded a stench so foul that many of those who were present fainted. But the faith of those who preserved their senses was wonderfully confirmed when they beheld a great white pillar rising out of the smoke, bearing on its summit a heavenly figure. So great is the force of this superstition that it survives to the present day among a race which has professed for centuries a religion which condemns it as a monstrous crime. Huck relates that young slaves of both sexes are even now poisoned with quicksilver and placed around the body of a Mongol prince there can be no more conclusive proof that the custom can subsist without the slightest reference to the religious idea of sacrifice. Buddhism encountered human sacrifices of another and far more spiritual kind in India. Hegel has very correctly explained how the pantheism of the Hindu religion led to the sanctification of suicide. The Hindus deprecate and despise the life of man. It has no more value, they say, than the life of nature and it can only acquire dignity by the negation of itself, to which all concrete existences are essentially opposed. Hence, 
and their ritual, men sacrifice themselves, and parents their children, and widows are burnt after their husband's death, not in satisfaction for guilt incurred, or to expiate a wrong, but only for the purpose of becoming meritorious. Hence, these acts must be spontaneous, for the victim dies not for others, but for himself, and be he ever so great a sinner, he becomes, by the act of self-sacrifice, pure from sin. In this form, the rite is peculiar to India, but it existed there in many other forms, whether of native growth or as Aryan imports. In later times, it was confined to the worship of Kali, but although recognized and regulated in the Vedas, it was discouraged and prevailed chiefly among the sects. Ritter and his great work on the geography of Asia has collected many instances of human sacrifice, either known by memorials are still practiced early in this century and about the time of Herber's travels. Since the volumes were published, the investigations of English officers have proved that a kind of vicarious sacrifice prevailed very extensively in southern India. Macpherson and Campbell discovered sects by whom human victims were regularly put to death in incredible numbers. Generally, they were bought for the purpose and were kept in comfort for years until the moment of their doom arrived when they were slain, in order to secure fine weather and rich crops, but seldom at the dictation of a subtle theology, such as that which devotes crowds of voluntary and cheerful victims to Cali. Part 4 The most perfect spectacle of the natural development of human sacrifice is afforded by America, where during fifteen centuries after the birth of Christ, and probably for as long a period before, the gods of idolatry, retained their authority unmolested by those influences which in the old world interrupted or altered the progress of paganism, such as the contact of nations not equally civilized, the rise of commerce, philosophy, and political freedom, the presence of a chosen people, and the action of monotheism, polytheism, and pantheism upon each other. The people of the new world, separated from the rest of mankind, lived for ages on their original stock of religious ideas which they, with persevering consistency, pushed to their extremest consequences. There is no other example of a civilized people whose religion was abandoned entirely to the action of its own laws, without the restraint of literature or speculation, and therefore without any recorded theological reform, such as those of Buddha and Zoroaster, or philosophical opposition like that of Socrates or Zeno. Here, then, the natural history of human sacrifice may be most distinctly traced from its conjectural origin to a development which is far beyond the last extreme ever reached in the regions of the eastern hemisphere. The multitude and variety of phenomena supplied by the universality of the custom and its tendency to indefinite increase render the study easy. So strictly do the essential qualities of American paganism correspond with those of the old world that they have been justly quoted as a proof of original unity. They both display the remnants of the same primitive traditions, acting on the same human nature, and the different stages of American civilization resemble each other far less closely than they resemble the corresponding stages of the civilization of the other continents. The similarity is not external, imported, or artificial, but the spontaneous fruit of similar principles and a common origin. Those facts which broadly divide the society of America from that of the rest of mankind and prove how early the separation must have been effected, the absence of domestic animals, and the ignorance of the pastoral life, are the same which most deeply mark the character of their religious worship. This shows that the continent was not peopled by the nomads who inhabit eastern Asia, for they, from time immemorial, have had flocks and herds, and have known the use of iron which was first made known in America by the European adventurers. The conquistadors found some civilized states surrounded by savage tribes of hunters and fishermen, but without the intermediate phase of pastoral life. This is the great feature that gives its peculiar character to their form of worship, as well as to their whole existence. Without the domestication of animals, the tribes of the New World lacked that powerful instrument for softening the wild nature of man which is not only a division of labor and an economy of strength, but a perpetual occasion for the exercise of self-control and unbought kindness. The Indian knew dumb animals only as food, 
and pursued them only to destroy them. His wars were as ferocious as his treatment of animals, for he could not learn in the violence of warfare the lesson of humanity, which was never taught him in ordinary life. As the Indians had no domestic animals, so they had no slaves. They killed their prisoners just as they killed the beasts they caught. To men whose means of existence were so precarious, every additional mouth to be fed added to their difficulty. Their enemies were put to death for the same reason which made a Pennsylvania chief at the end of the last century foresee their own extinction. Quote, the white man lives on grain, and we on flesh. This flesh takes thirty months to grow, and it is often hard to find, but every one of those wonderful seeds they sow into the earth returns them more than a hundredfold. The flesh on which we live has four legs to run away upon, and we have only two to catch it with, but the seeds remains where it is sown. That is why the white man has more children and lives longer than we. Therefore, I say, before the cedars of our village are dead, and the maple trees in the valley cease to yield sugar, the little race of the sowers of grain will have exterminated the race of the eaters of meat, unless the hunters begin to sow. Unquote. Every war threatened them with starvation. They had no time to spare from the pursuit of game. No idlers could stay at home and provide them with food, nothing which the woman could prepare. When many of them came together to fight an enemy, the places through which they passed did not contain food enough for their number, even if they had had time to catch it. They were therefore compelled to make the war support them and to live upon what they could get from their enemies. But these were in the same plight, and the conquerors could obtain nothing but the bodies of the captives and the slain. In this extremity, in very early times, famine soon taught the hunter, whose food was all flesh, and who deemed all animal flesh eatable, that there was no specific difference between that of man and beast. Thus, in time of war and scarcity, the hunter becomes by easy stages a cannibal. Hunger is, however, but a temporary and local cause of the cannibalism, which may be shown to have existed in early times throughout the continent. Other inducements would be required in order to make it a general and permanent custom, even in times of peace and plenty. The first step was to regard cannibalism as the natural mode of disposing of a slaughtered enemy. After it had been done often, when there was reason for it, and done with some solemnity and rejoicing, by men flushed with victory and with the excitement of danger and bloodshed, they became unwilling to forego the same festivity when there was no necessity and no provocation but the presence of the captive. The idea of feasting on the body of the enemy was not easily dissociated from success in war, and even in places where there was an abundance of vegetable food, captives and strangers were eaten. As an act of vengeance and retaliation, it spread from those who had done it from necessity to those whom the splendid vegetation of tropical America preserved from such necessity. Hence we find the practice confined in some cases to prisoners. When the Spaniards in 1528, driven to extremity by famine, devoured their dead comrades, the natives of Florida were filled with horror at the sight, though they would have rejoiced to eat an enemy. On the other hand, we find it unusual among the inhabitants of very fertile countries. The idea of revenge superseded the condition of hunger, and the idea of sacrifice preserved the custom even in peaceful times. It was natural to give the gods the same food which was eaten by their worshippers. They were supposed to have the same tastes as men, and human flesh had become a luxury to those who had first eaten it from necessity. That which was eaten in moments of victory, and with a sense of triumph, was especially suited for an oblation to the spirits. Thus it became a regular habit to offer to the gods the flesh of slaughtered captives, and this custom is the vast background of the human sacrifices of America. In some cases, as among Caribbees, cannibalism long survived the sacrifice of human victims, but even here it is certain that the custom formerly subsisted. In other places, and this is the great fact in the history of human sacrifice in Central America, cannibalism had long been extinct in ordinary life, when it was still preserved as a part of the religious rites. But if human sacrifice in America sprang from cannibalism, and owed its extension to the scarcity of animals, it did not disappear with the progress of civilization and wealth. The Pawnees, who according to Gallatin, were among the gentlest of the Indians, and who never tortured their prisoners, 
nevertheless offered up a human victim annually at sowing time to secure a good harvest. We find instances of captives who were killed and eaten without any religious ceremony whatever, but were nevertheless treated with extraordinary kindness down to the moment of a quick and painless death. In Brazil, the prisoner was entertained for a year. A wife was given him, and not a word of unkindness was spoken to him till he was killed and eaten. A neighboring tribe considered this not as an act of enmity, but as an affectionate favor. They abominated those who ate their enemies, but they killed and ate their own relations when they saw that their end was approaching. Among the South American Indians, the temptation to cannibalism was so strong that the Spanish officers felt obliged to permit even the baptized tribes to kill and devour their enemies. The human sacrifices of the Americas were various in intention. In its lowest form, the rite was meant to supply the dead with the blood for which they thirsted. The torture of captives was intended as an expiation for the slain, and was in some cases a substitute for ancient sacrifices. The gods, too, had their share of the booty, and of the captives amongst the rest. But the idea of the enjoyment the gods derived from the sacrifice was utterly material and sensual. The Iroquois prayed to Arioski that he would eat the flesh of the victim and reward them with victory. In Florida, the firstborn child was sacrificed to the son, and one of the Peruvian tribes always immolated the first child of every mother. On the Missouri, these sacrifices have occurred even in the present century. In early times, this Syrian rite was performed all over Central America. In Chile, they sacrificed the favorite child on every urgent occasion. He ultra detestable circumstantia que manda bien la especie del pecado, y es que si lo por ellos preguntado, es cosa de muchísima importancia, metidos en aquela escura estancia, de guelen a hijalo, mas amado, o la especiosa niña en sacrificio para tener el ideolo propicio. The most exalted instance of human sacrifice in the legends of the Indian tribes is that of the American Iphigenia, Hiawatha's daughter, who perished to save Onodagas. But the great extension of human sacrifice in America did not take place among ignorant savages or thriftless hunters or hungry cannibals. It was the act of the Mexicans, the most humane, the most highly civilized, and the most prosperous of all the races that inhabited the continent. It was the result not of degradation, but of extraordinary moral energy and fidelity to religious conviction. Instead of being an extension of a national cannibalism, it preserved in the service of the temples the practice which the refined and wealthy people had otherwise long discarded. Far from being prompted by revenge, it was a mode of death often chose as an honor by the noblest of the people. It was not an act of cruelty, for the death was as prompt as possible, and in certain cases the victim was feasted and venerated for months before his death. Almost all the degrading accessories, all the mixture of other than purely spiritual elements, which were inseparable from human sacrifice in the rest of the world, were things unknown to those ceremonials of Central America, which have rightly been called the most tremendous religious drama in the whole of paganism. The scale on which the rite was performed distinguishes it not in proportions merely, but in kind from all other oblations of human victims, like the Hyperboreans, the Tartars, and the Romans in the circus. They did not merely give their children like the worshippers of Moloch, or their captives, like most savage tribes. The occasion was not, as among the Greeks, some actual guilt to be atoned, or some particular expiation to be commemorated. Their sacrifices included all kinds of human victims, their own children, their nobles, who freely volunteered, and prisoners in mass. They were constant and regular, and the number of the victims was the very largest which it is possible to supply. The idea from which they sprung was that of original universal sinfulness, a guilt which the most enormous sacrifices could hardly wipe away, a chasm between man and the divinity, which the very utmost efforts would not do more than fill up. This notion of the necessity of a universal atonement for a guilt inherited and not incurred, independent of all actual sin, expiable only in infinite time by the incessant immolation of men, on a scale which must needs always increase, 
until it must have eventually terminated in a sort of national suicide, was unknown to the paganism of antiquity, and was, in one respect, a deeper view of religion than the Gentiles had hitherto attained. But there was another idea vaguely present in the minds of the ancients, but utterly lost to the Mexicans. The idea that all sacrifice is insufficient, that its merit can only be that it symbolizes, or prefigures, or commemorates, a perfect and divine sacrifice, and that it is a sign of spiritual efforts of the soul. Hence the stress and value of their sacrifice was in the ritual alone. It was not a sign, but the actual purchase money of human redemption. Its merit was in quantity and accumulation. In the Mexican sacrifices, paganism exhausted and confounded itself in a way exactly opposite to that by which it reached its end in the ancient world where religion lost its power over men partly through the intellectual opposition of philosophy and partly through the moral degradation of society and was neither believed in nor obeyed but the aztecs were a strange contrast to the greeks and romans they united the simple credulity of the homeric age with the moral strength of the stoics so far from abandoning their religion it continually exacted larger sacrifices which they willingly made no claims of the gods staggered their faithfulness or their zeal. They did not fall into the extremes of ferocity or sensuality. They still believed in their gods with a primitive sincerity and testified to their belief with an increasing submissiveness and earnestness. And yet this energetic consistency in their heathen practices would have ended in the depopulation of the country. Through maintaining a form of worship more contrary to nature and more constant with the schemes of hell, than the most infamous aberrations of declining Hellenism. If in the old world paganism was confuted by the intellectual capacity of the Greeks, it may be said that it was reduced to absurdity in the new world by the moral energy of the Mexicans. Garcilaso has induced many to believe that the gentle government of the Incas extinguished human sacrifice in Peru, but, in fact, although it was diminished and regulated, it still survived. The mildness of the customs did not mitigate the practice any more than Saturn's golden reign prevented him from being the special god who was pleased with human victims. The worship of the sun, with which human sacrifice was connected throughout Central America, prevailed also in Peru. At the accession of an Inca, great numbers of children were buried alive. At the death of another, one thousand persons were immolated, and one of the Incas sacrificed his own son in the hope of recovering his health. Yet unquestionably, there was in Peru a restraining and opposing influence, and among the Aztecs alone did human sacrifice flourish without any symptom of fear or shame or loathing among the people or the kings. All the forms of human sacrifice prevailed in Mexico. The innocent were put to death as the most precious oblation to the idol. Men of rank selected this mode of death, sometimes for the good of the people, sometimes as an honor to themselves. Some victims of great distinction were identified with the god to whom they were to be sacrificed, and represented his death by their own. Decorated with the insignia of the sun, they led a life of luxury and ease, and were invoked by the people as powerful mediators, until with great ceremony they were slain before the idols. The wives and children of the nobles were often buried in their graves. When the victims had no special merit individually, they gained importance by their numbers, and when this principle was once admitted, it followed inevitably that the numbers ever continued to increase. Any diminution in the quantity of victims would be an explanation of the anger of the gods, and the successes of Cortes were actually attributed to the relaxation in the zeal with which victims were supplied by Montezuma. In reality, there was no diminution, except from the exhausted supply of captives, of whom his immediate predecessor had made a wasteful slaughter. In ordinary years, at the most probable estimate, 2,500 human victims perished at Mexico. The skulls piled up in the temple were found to amount to 136,000, and in a town of moderate size there were near 100,000 skulls. The great temple at Mexico was finished in 1487 and inaugurated in the following year. For a long time, captives had been collected for this occasion, and when the time came, 84,000 men were sacrificed and 16,000 more were added to them before the end of the year. The name of the monarch who perpetrated this unexampled butchery 
is used to this day in Mexico as a synonym for a scourge. Prescott, who has failed to comprehend the nature of the sanguinary rite of Anhuac, and to whom the very notion of sacrifice seems to be unintelligible, in his anxiety to brand these customs by the most degrading comparison he can conceive, borrows from Voltaire the idea of comparing the Mexican priests to the Dominicans, and their ceremonies to the modern Inquisition. Even if we could admit his supposition of, quote, fiendish passions, unquote, as the motive in either case, still no comparison could be more infelicitous than that of a tribunal essentially political, and serving after a fashion the ends of state, with one so entirely and intensely religious that the wealth and prosperity of the country was deliberately sacrificed to it. And yet, long after the last victim had fallen in honor of the sun-god of the Aztecs, the civilized nations of Christian Europe continued to wage wholesale destruction on as vast a scale against persons accused of no crime against the civil order, and not even convicted of the religious guilt which was imputed to them. The parallel phenomenon of trials for witchcraft ought to explain to us the power of superstition to familiarize men with the most inhuman butchery of helpless beings. Here there was no distinction of religion or of calling. Protestants and Catholics, clergy and laity, vied with each other for two hundred years to provide victims, and every refinement of legal ingenuity and torture was used in order to increase their number. In the north of Italy, the great jurist, Alcadius, saw a hundred witches burnt on one day. In a little town of Silesia, a hundred and two witches were executed in the year 1651. And in a village of Hesse, with 540 inhabitants, 30 suffered in four years. At Salzburg, in 1678, a murrain among the cattle cost 97 suspected persons their lives. In the neighborhood of Werdenfels, in Bavaria, nearly all the women were exterminated. In two villages near Treves, all but two were put to death. The Jesuit Spee, whose hair turned prematurely gray in his terrible calling, attended two hundred in two years, every one of whom had confessed in order to escape torture. He tells us of a single judge who had sent five hundred witches to the flames, and another had caused seven hundred to be burnt in the course of nineteen years. At Quittlenburg, in the year 1589, on one day, a hundred and thirty-three witches were put to death, in two villages of the Diocese of Mentz, the dean condemned 300 persons to die for the crime of witchcraft. A single bishop of Würzburg condemned 219, and the bishop of Bamberg, where the population did not exceed 100,000, caused a report to be published in 1659 of the death of 600 witches in his episcopate. In England alone, under the Tudors and the Stuarts, the victims of this superstition amounted to 30,000. Yet, from the appearance of Spee's Cautio in 1631 to the burning of the last witch in 1783, all sensible men were persuaded that the victims were innocent of the crimes for which they suffered intolerable torments and an agonizing death. But those who hunted them out with cunning perseverance, and the inflexible judges who never spared their lives, firmly believed that their execution was pleasing in the sight of God, and that their sin could not be forgiven by men. If this was done amid the civilization of modern Europe, by experienced jurists and by Christian bishops, from an erroneous interpretation of the precepts of religion, it is surely ridiculous to attribute to unintelligent barbarity and to treat with a contemptuous horror the enormous efforts of expiation which were made by the unhappy Mexicans, who for 1,500 years were deprived of the gospel of redemption, and who sacrificed the most precious thing on earth because they were ignorant of the death of that victim who alone could take away the sins of the world.